Welcome to the Tough Fish Show. I am so excited to bring to you Diane Barnes. Diane, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you, Jen, for inviting me on the show. I'm really excited to be here today. Oh, I'm so glad you are. I think this will be a lot of fun. And I would love for you to start by sharing, how'd you get into writing? I've loved writing since I was a little kid, but um, the first time I really remember getting into it was in second grade my second grade teacher, we all went out for recess. And when we came back, there were these giant paper footprints all around the room. They were on the floor, over desk, under desk, leading to the window and then out the window. And we had to write a story about what happened when we were at, research, at um, recess, where do these giant footsteps come from? So they gave you those little composition books that you get when you're in grammar school. And I filled mine up with a story. And then I asked for another one and I was still writing when it was time to go home and I asked for more. And from that day, I just really have never stopped writing. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. My, um, I remember being in elementary school too and having a teacher say, your poems are really, really good. And they were turned into a young author's convention. And I remember thinking, oh, wow, I got to go to that. So I know what you mean when something starts young like that and it feels like you found something there yeah i loved it and um throughout elementary school and middle school whenever we had a creative writing um, assignment they i they teacher would always pick mine and i would have to go to the head of the class and read it out loud and that was the part i was always bad at like i could write it fine at my desk you know sitting by myself but um being a little bit introverted but getting in front of the class and reading it that was the hard part for me but the writing part i loved and then even in college, I took history courses and we had, you know, assignments in history. And I never just wrote a history paper. I always wrote short stories set in a historical background. And my um, friends would be like, wait, what are you doing? That's not the assignment. And I'm like, well, no, it shows that I learned about what was going on. It's just, the, and the teachers loved it. The professors loved it. So I love that so much. Okay. So a couple of things are coming to me. So first off, the fact that you had to read it out loud, albeit yes. It's a little scary, but it does help for public speaking. The other thing it does though, is even when you're writing a blog or you're writing a draft by yourself, when you're reading out loud, you hear if there's a mistake, you hear if there's something that should be tweaked in some way, you can even hear if dialogue's working because that's actually where you're picking up. Is, would you actually say it and say it this way? So actually, I think reading out loud was a wonderful thing, despite the fact it might have been nerve wracking. <laughs> right, right. And now when I'm writing, I always read chapters out loud when I finish them. It's part of the revision um, process. And not only do I read them out loud myself, I do the recording on my computer, the voice recording that reads it for you. And I just sit there and I listen to see how it sounds. So hearing out loud is really important. Yes. Oh, I love that. Using the tool, using the computer to help you with that. That's mm -hmm. a wonderful tip. And I love that you took history, but you made it fun that you made it your own and told stories that that is so yeah, I was the kid who would would much rather take a write an essay any day of the week instead of having to take a standardized test. So, right. <laughs> so as I hear you say that I'm like, sounds like you might have preferred the essays too. <laughs> Oh, that is so awesome. That is so awesome. So what helped you to pivot into writing as a career then? It's something I always wanted to do. So um, I majored in journalism in college and I was writing for a newspaper and writing for magazines and I always wanted to write a novel and I had been working on one like off and on through the years, but it just never really seriously. And then one year my friend said to me for National Novel Writing Month, we should do that this year. And I said, okay, I'll do this with you. And we did it and it was so much fun. And we really spent like every hour that we weren't working, working on our novels. And I had spent, I put so much time into it during that November that I'm like, well, I have to see this through now. I can't just, you know, let this half draft <laughs> just sit there and languish in a bottom of draw someplace. So I, I just, I was determined to finish it and see what happened. I, that's so cool. And yeah. like you, I have an undergrad in journalism. So that's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing how so many things kind of blend together to kind of get you like a divine breadcrumb to kind of get you where you're supposed to go. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and the journalism background definitely helped. Like writing teaches you how to write concisely, just the facts that you need. So I found that was a really big help for fiction writing. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Would you think that that's that idea though also helps with writing like the book blurbs and things like that because of the idea of you have to write a hook if you if you're structuring it journalistic fashion then you're writing with the idea of things being above the fold so if it had to move to the another page everything that you needed to know and more impactful was more above the fold if you will so does that help with like book blurbs yes. and things like yeah. that that's a really great way to think of it. I never really thought of it that way. And that is actually the part of writing that I struggle with the most, writing the blurbs. So um, I'm, I'm going to have to think of it that way next time. But yeah. But, but you know, I, I think that's, a, I'm really glad you said that though, because sometimes it is where you're writing, the writing, the creativity is one thing and getting the story out is one thing. But then when you're trying to write, it's a different way of writing. Journalism is a different way of writing writing in a marketing kind of style, like a book blurb, is a still a different way of writing than the creative writing that went into the book. I mean, the book blurb's creative, but it's still a form of a marketing piece, just like a proposal is a marketing piece. It's a business proposal versus the creative outlet per se. So it's, it, it, there are four different forms of writing that you're leveraging in this, in a writing career. Right. And the blurb, it sort of has to follow a formula, right? There's like things that you know you have to do. So I think that's why I sort of struggle with forcing creativity into that formula. Oh, I love that you point that out, though, because I think that that is important to to hear what you what you feel like if you feel like you're forcing it, it's going to feel that way. So to know when to back off, when to go back, how to ebb and flow in that dance. And that's important with any of any writing that we're doing. So I, I love that you've shared that. That is so, so cool. Um, so mixed signals, how did that really come about? Mixed signals. That was a fun book to write. Um, my niece had just graduated from college and she is a sports broadcaster, sports journalist. And she was telling me a story about how when she was doing stories, the men would ask, you know, she'd be getting rated on her appearance and that sort of thing, which male journalists never have to deal with. And just, so, you know, when she was telling me about it, it, I was thinking of an idea for a new book. And so the talk show, the sports talk show, that's how I thought of that by talking to her. But it's really a story about a woman who's going through a breakup and trying to get over it. That's the basis of it. And I just think that that's something a lot of people can relate to. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. So when you're writing, do you feel like there's an overall theme or two that you're specifically teasing out with so that every story that you create has a similar theme or concept or does each one kind of get its own? Like, is there some golden thread for all of them or what? I think each one it starts off as its own idea, but then when I go back and I look at the three books that I've published, there does seem to be a theme and in the end it's women who they end up relying on themselves or realizing they're stronger than they think than when the book started right they learn that they have the inner strength to get them through what they're going through i love that i love that so much because that's such a powerful message then and that means that you can actually take any story that you create then in you can take them from different directions but they still have this overall idea like that i I love that so, so much. I think that's so cool. So how did Waiting for Ethan come about then? Uh, Waiting for Ethan, that was my first novel and that's the one I did during Nano. And ah. that was going back to way back when I was single, I had a friend who was a, a divorce attorney and she would always set me up with, you know, think to set me up with some of her divorce men clients. <laughs> and so, just not a good thing to do date men who are just getting divorced so the book started out as a woman like dating a series of divorced men but then it just all the kind of crazy things about that i just put into one character ethan so that's how i think i dare for that team about <laughs> but i love that you took inspiration from things happening in real life and then figure yeah. out how do i take this and then weave in the creativity and weave in something to create a story and a, a transformation for the the protagonist and so forth right. so what um when you when you're creating these stories what kind of writing process do you go through 
So this is gonna sound weird, but I always sort of hear a line. Like I'll just be driving and I'll get, a, I'll hear like a, a line and I start the story with that first line. And sometimes the line, as I write, you know, that line never makes it into the book. <laughs> But that's, the, you know, the inspiration of how I start the book. Like, I, get, I have the idea of what I want to write about. And then I'll, I'll get this line and then I'll just go from there. And I try to think of, I don't use outlines. I find that when I use outlines, my writing comes out very stilted. So instead, I just write down a few big plot points. So maybe I'll have four or five different points throughout the book. And then whatever happens in between, that's just, you know, up to my imagination. It's free. So I'm not there's not really a map. It's, I know where I have to go, but I can get there any way I want to get there. Cool, cool. So have you ever felt like a character was sort of taking over the story? Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Yes. And how did you go through that? How did you, how did you work with your character who might have been so determined? <laughs> um, I just keep following it. And, you know, sometimes it, I have to go back and I'll have to delete a whole bunch of scenes that came before because the character takes a crazy right turn that I didn't see coming. And I'll think, okay, but this is better. You know, it, somehow when the character takes over, it always ends up being better. So I just follow it and see where it goes. And then I have to go back and say, well, now this part isn't gonna work. But I also do something that I don't write in order a lot of the time. So as a scene comes to me, I'll write that scene and then I'll go back to the last scenes that I wrote. I'll say, okay, now what has to happen for me to get to that scene that's like way towards the end of the book? I so. love that. I think that that's so cool. But to me, that's a really cool way of your journalism background coming into play because you're letting your curiosity follow you. And a lot of it about journalism is leveraging your curiosity and, in, and your investigative skills, if you will, <laughs> your questioning skills to say, okay, where's this going? What am I going to do with this? How am I going to shape this? And when you see something happening and it's like, wait, does this still flow? You're willing to step back and look at it objectively to go, what do I need to do to, to honor the space of this? So I love how your background just kind of yeah. amplifies this and just makes it better for your, your readers and your characters. That's awesome. And for you, that's awesome. Yeah. It's fun. That is really, really cool. So when you are writing, and I know you mentioned that you will read it out loud or use the computer to, to tell it to you, you know, say it back to you out loud, mm -hmm. but when do you choose to weave in, uh, for instance, advanced read or beta readers or uh, editors, that kind of thing? How, how does your process kind of work as you involve other people? So throughout the whole, my whole writing, from the time I start, I do work with a writing group. So I'll give very rough drafts to my writing group and we read out loud in my writing group. Everyone reads a chapter out loud. So there again, it's reading aloud and I'll get their feedback right from the get-go. Um, then when I finish a first draft, and I mean really finish, it has to be like a solid first draft, then I'll give it to beta readers. And then I'll get their feedback and start on other drafts after that. But my first draft, I end up keep going back to the beginning. So I end up, it takes me longer to write a first draft, but it's a lot cleaner than probably a typical first draft. No, but it sounds like if I'm hearing you correctly, then you're writing, you go back and rework a little bit. You're writing a little bit more. If something hits you, you go back and rework. So yeah. it might seem like it's, it's, so to me, it sounds first off iterative where you're working through it and you keep moving. But when you feel like it's a, a good draft, that's where you feel good saying this is done. And it, that actually, again, feels like how I worked papers and still yeah. work my own things. Like my first draft is usually multiple iterations before I get there. But yeah, I I see. I think that a lot of this is that journalism <laughs> coming into play. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so it's hard to say when people say, how many drafts did you do? I don't know because yeah, by the yeah. time I wrote the end, maybe it's only two or three drafts, but I went back so many times before I reached those, you know, those final two words. Oh my gosh. But I, I do the same thing. And even as a, a, as a developmental editor, when I'm reading my clients drafts, I still go back, even though it says first, you know, couple of rounds of edits, I am like, I will tell you when I'm really done because I will be going back through and a couple of them said like, you weren't kidding. You've probably been back in here like six times. I'm like, but 
I know what I'm trying. I'm seeing this build and I want to make sure that I feel like I'm delivering you the best result I can for the, at least for what your first round is. And then your second round. So I, I love hearing somebody else say that they do this for their own work. It makes me so happy to hear that. I'm glad you do it that way. I do. Yeah. Because a lot of people don't, right. They, they just, I mean, you're taught just right through until you get to the end. That's what people want to tell you about writing. How do you finish a book? Just right through until you get to the end. And I'm like, well, I don't do that. <laughs> so. Yep. Yep. And I just like, and there's times when it might be, yeah, go ahead and finish it from where it is just to get the, the, the rest of the thoughts out. But that doesn't mean that you're done with this draft. It just means you're getting the thoughts completed. And that's sometimes there's that dance because if you can sometimes stay a little too much in your head. And so how do you balance the, you know, I know I need to massage this a little bit more, but could you be polishing the stone a little too much versus continuing to get a skeleton, if you will, built? How do you strike that balance? And how would you advise someone who might be struggling with the polishing the stone element? So I learned um, during nano, because when you have to write 50,000 words in a month, that I just write, like, I don't go back for that. I just write, I mean, it, a lot of times it's just gibberish by the end of it. So I'll write those 50,000 words and then that's when the real work begins, right? So in those 50,000 words, there really is, the whole story is there. It's just not in a way that anyone's gonna understand it except for me, so. <laughs> that is awesome. It's a different language. It's not even, sometimes it's not even like English or a lot of times this, when I write, it's all dialogue. It's just dialogue, 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 dialogue. And I'm not writing a screenplay here, so. Right, but you know, that's a great point though, because sometimes writing the dialogue might be what you need to get the point across that you want to convey because to your point with the iterative process you can go back and say now I need to world build this or I need to show this character here or wait I just introduced a character out of nowhere (laughs) I need to figure out how to weave them in or (laughs) weave in an introduction so they just don't seem like hey (laughs) <laughs> yeah. I've showed up out of nowhere out of this yeah. book and we're at 150 pages in great where are you coming from <laughs> yeah that just happened to me on a book that I'm working on now when aunt showed up I'm like wait oh. we're like I'm halfway through this book now and this aunt has showed up and but I like this character I'm like okay I need to go back to the beginning I need to work her in <laughs> <laughs> but I love that I think that's cool because sometimes you need those pieces but to your point we got to connect the dots and bring them through. I, that is so cool. So would you talk a bit about more than? Yes. More than is my last book that came out and it's the story of Peggy Moriarty. She's a grieving widow with Mm. two twin children. And she is the ultimate helicopter mom. She just lives for these kids and really her only other interest is a TV show where a medium connects the grieving with their deceased loved ones. And Peggy's kids are about to go to college and she doesn't know what she's gonna do with herself. And she always dreams of going on the TV program, but she doesn't have the confidence because of her appearance, she's overweight. And before the kids leave for college, they give her a gift certificate for a gym. And at first Peggy's really insulted by this gift, but then she thinks, well, maybe if I go to the gym, I'll lose some weight and I can be on the program. So she goes, she takes the exercise classes And her life is changed, not by the way her body changes, but by the people she meets in the exercise class. She makes friends and she learns that there's life outside her children, that she's more than a mom, she's more than a widow, and she's more than a body type. I love that. Yeah. Oh, I love that so, so much. And I love that her children gave her that gift. Yes. You know, I think that that's so beautiful because sometimes the things that, you know, we see or we're a part of every day, we don't always realize the impact we're having. And her children demonstrated that. And hopefully when your readers are feeling, they read that, they feel that, and it's reminding them, hey, you're more than too. There's more with you too. I hope that readers get that message. I love that. Now, what inspired this story? Because I think that that's just powerful and beautiful and I bet it's funny because there's got it sounds to me like there's going to be humor in there as well so tell me so how did how did you the story come about so more than I started that during nano (laughs) another nano (laughs) another nano another nano book two of my three books I started during nano and um 
I was writing a different story and wasn't going anywhere. And I think like 10 days of November had come, had passed. I'm like, I'm never going to get to 50,000 words. And then I'm like, I need to write about something different that I love. And I was taking an exercise class and I loved the women in my class that we just had so much fun. We just laughed throughout the whole thing. And they were just great people that I met. And I'm like, I'm going to write about the exercise class. And I remember I called my friend and I'm like, I'm writing about boot camp. She's like, wait, that's all you got? I'm like, that's all I have, but the story's going to come from that. I'm just writing about something that happens in a boot camp. And so during the rest of November, it was now down to 20 days. I cranked out 50,000 words. I mean, that book is nothing like the book that got published, but the idea for the story was there. So the inspiration was definitely the class that I was taking and the, the women that I met and how much fun we had. I love that. I think that's so charming. So yeah. would you talk a bit about your publishing process, please? Um, so for Waiting for Ethan, after I finished writing it, I did, I queried agents and I was lucky. I had a lot of success in, with my query letter nice. and that I, I had a lot of requests for the full manuscript. And then I met an agent, talked to an agent who I absolutely loved. And she has been my agent since that first book. That's and, awesome. Yeah. So when I finish, I give her the books now and she finds the publishers for me. So I love that because uh, what you by sharing that, it just gives other, it gives writers hope because that is a challenging process that to write a query because it, it is a, it's a different type of writing and it's, it's one of those where, you know, you, you're still trying to figure out like how did it not land because of this, or maybe I should have done that, or did I not, it, maybe it wasn't just the right fit for the agent. Did I not do enough research with it or what have you? And I just think that that's powerful when you know that when you hear from someone else, I was able to successfully do this. It means it, there's success for that for other people too. You can do this too. Absolutely. <laughs> and I'll, I took a lot, I went to a lot of writing conferences, especially while I was writing, waiting for Ethan and I met agents and I met editors and part of it, you can have your work critiqued. And whenever there was that opportunity, and even now I always still sign up for that because there's still so much to learn. So one of the things I, I had critiqued was my query letter. And the first agent who I met with who read my query letter was like, no, 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 no. And we spent like the 20 minute critique, like starting from fresh. He's like, you know, he, helped, he helped, he really helped me. So I felt I had a strong query going into it. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Do you have any suggestions for someone who is putting together a query so that they have some ideas of what might make it really so they have some clues as to what might make theirs uh, potentially a strong query letter? What I learned from him, and this was, the th it seems sort of evident, but when you have to write about yourself, that was the part of the query that I was having, that I was struggling with the most. Like, what are your qualifications to write this? I'm like, I don't know. I just decided to write a book. And he's like, no, you didn't. He's like, you take, you go to these conferences, you take classes. He's like that. So for my debut, those were important details to include in the query, which I didn't have in my original. And so it was more touting myself, you know, in my, he's like, you're a journalism. You're like, that's the kind of stuff that should, you know, should be in here. So, and then having the catchy, the, the tagline, the 30 minute, 30 second on um, elevator speech and being able to boil that down to a sentence or two. Yep. And the, that's awesome. I think that that's fantastic. And to your point about writing about yourself, um, a tip that I've found helpful is to write about yourself first in third person. If it, it might feel hard to say, I did this and I did that. But if you write it in the context of third person, then you might feel like you can handle writing about yourself a little differently because you're writing about Diane, you're writing about Jen, right. you're not writing I, I'm, I'm writing about Jen. So that kind of, that shift helps because then, you'll start to see those things. But the more that you realize what you're bringing to the table, the more your, I mean, your confidence blooms, you you grow and you see, yeah, I've got, I've got it going on. I can do this. I've, right. I'm the right person for this. Yeah. So I, I love that you mentioned that. I love that you mentioned that. How I, one, of my, um, I, one of my first jobs, I had to write um, a piece about introducing the staff of the magazine. And I was the person who like interviewed all the people and wrote the new people. And I had to write also include myself in that. And so when my manager was reviewing it, she's like, everyone's write up is so great. You get all these details except for yours. Like you, <laughs> it's like, so I was like, oh, 
so the time I had spent interviewing them and getting to know them and you know promoting them like I just then I just had like two sentences about myself so I had to go back and I should have learned then but well no but I mean when you're writing about yourself whether it's like as a resume whether it's an interview piece whether it's a bio or a query you know all of those or even like an about page on your website all of those things it's a different way of writing. It's a different way of essentially packaging information and packaging your material, but you are that piece. You are contributing those pieces and the language that's used, the, the structuring of it, all of those things help to convey like a, a, a message, a, a brand about you, but it helps people to understand about what you're bringing, but you own that. And the more that you see and appreciate it, it doesn't feel like you're selling yourself. It just feels like you're sharing who you are. And that's that's also, I think, a sticky point for writers is, well, I don't want to sell. And I look at it like, but you want to share your work, right? You want to share the gifts that you have. Well, yeah, then focus it on sharing, but you've got to show what your gifts are too. You have to share your gifts of you and your and your work. So it's sharing. And that shift tends to help a lot that's because great, that's a great way to think of it. Yeah, because it's not a it's not a matter of saying, oh, I you have, you're sitting there going, oh, I'm all that in a bag of chips. It's more about you saying, <laughs> look at yeah. here's here's what I bring, here's what I'm bringing to the table, and here's why this book would be so an amazing read for you. I I love that you got the guidance that you did. I think that that is so cool, and I think it's so cool how your background was breadcrumb after breadcrumb leading to you to this particular spot. I think that that's fantastic. What kind of book, what kind of things do you have on the horizon? So right now I'm actually working on two different novels. And During NaNoWriMo. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm actually not doing NaNoWriMo, but to, my two different novels, um, they're completely different. One's about a woman who she's middle-aged and she dreams about being able to go back to when she was in her early 20s. And then her wish comes true, except that she doesn't go back to her 20s when she was 20, she goes back in the present time. So everyone she knows is older and she's just sort of dropped in and as a 20 something. <laughs> and then my other one is about a completely different, it's about um, a married couple who struggles to have a baby and the impact on their marriage. So let's kind of have a fun one and, and more serious one. How do you move between the two different styles like that? So I started the one the story about the baby first and I needed a break because, mm -hmm. and so then I did the one that's a lot more fun. And um, then I decided I need to finish one. I can't keep going back and forth. So then I just <laughs> picked one. <laughs> yeah. But that's cool because they both, it sounded like they both also were creating inspiration and to your point one needed to take a little bit more traction but in the same breath both of them were created because the, the ideas were flowing but for two different directions I think that's a really cool thing because it basically it's a form of wit you know and showing where the ideas can come that's cool yeah that is so so cool Diane thank you so much for sharing such awesome tips and how people can, if they will look at their path and see all the gifts that they have along their journey, how amazingly they can use them to contribute their gifts and their books and to get their books out there. I just, you've been doing that. So I think it's so cool. Thank you. Thank where you. can people connect with you and where can they get the books? Sure. Um, my books are available wherever books are sold online. So Barnes and Noble, Amazon, Apple books, anywhere. And my website is dianembarnes.com. And I'm on Twitter and Instagram as dianebarnes777. Diane, thank you so much for being on the show. This has thank been you. so much fun. It was fun to talk to you.